It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. Lots of security news. He'll have an update on the last week's Patch Tuesday for Microsoft Windows users. We'll talk about a major court decision when it comes to unlocking your smartphone. And finally, who's willing to pay up to $2 million for zero-day exploits? Zerodium. We'll have all the details coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 697, recorded Tuesday, January 15th, 2019, Zerodium. Security Now is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Start your new career in IT or level up with flexible IT training from IT Pro TV. Visit go.itpro.tv slash security now to take advantage of their biggest sale yet. Standard memberships are just $29 a month, but you can get an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use the code SN30 at checkout. And by Sophos Cybersecurity. In an age of evolving cyber threats, you need evolved cybersecurity. Powered by artificial intelligence, Sophos can detect threats before they strike, killing ransomware, viruses, and other cyber threats dead in their tracks. Get a free security scan and or a free trial today at Sophos.com. And by Atlassian. Atlassian software powers the full spectrum of collaboration between IT teams and the rest of your organization. Visit Atlassian.com to find out which Atlassian tools are right for your team and give their products a try for free. It's time for Security Now! Yay! The best part of your week has just begun. Featuring this fellow right here, Mr. Steve Gibson, the host and moderator of our show. Hello, Steve. And in a big... And a big surprise this week, Leo, I know not only what episode number this is, but also what year it is. And those <laughs> Congratulations. should all, all be correct on the show notes <laughs> and in all communication going forward. Yay. Um, I Normally, I have a hard time. Well, not normally. Sometimes I have a hard time like focusing down on a single topic. And actually, there was some competition because there was a lot of interesting news this week, but the huge inflation of reward for zero days paid by Zerodium so also sort of, I thought this was apropos because we've been talking about Sandbox Escaper who seems so annoyed by the fact that she's unable to cash in her zero days. It's like, uh, what? Anyway, so – and again, we've talked about this before, but I wanted to kind of come back to it, especially in light of the fact that <laughs> – well, I'll save it. I won't step on this, but uh, the bounty has gone insane, and it really does sort of create an ethical question, I think, about the idea of an entity paying an, an insane amount of money – for zero days, which is what Zerodium purchases. And it's like, uh, okay. So anyway, we're going to talk about that. But before we get to that, we've got some intended and unintended consequences of last week's Windows Patch Tuesday. And, you know, sometimes I'm feeling self-conscious that we don't talk about Patch Tuesday on Tuesday, which is, you know, when the podcast is. It turns out that the aftermath of what happens is almost more interesting than the than the the like the the news of what's being fixed. It's what's what the patches broke, uh, and and then and what the remediation is for those. Because Microsoft, uh, if anyone who listens to Windows Weekly with Paul and you and Mary Jo on Wednesdays is you know <laughs> is knowing how they're now feeling about Microsoft's attempts to keep this sinking ship afloat. Anyway, uh, so we've got intended and unintended consequences of last week's Patch Tuesday. Also, speaking of unintended consequences, the U.S. government shutdown has had some as well that we'll talk about. We've also got a significant privacy failure in WhatsApp, 
which, which of course is based on the signal protocol, which itself is excellent, but someone found somebody else's um, communications uh, in her new phone, and we look into and explain that, uh, and we actually have a corollary to the TNO, trust no one slogan for this podcast as a consequence. Uh, we've got another ransomware decryptor with a twist, uh, some forward motion on the DNS over TLS front. That is this general movement to move DNS away from unencrypted UDP over into encrypted and authenticated uh, TLS or HTTPS. Uh, we've got two different takes on expectations of the threat landscape for 2019. Uh, and of course, I couldn't resist saying a cloudy forecast for the Weather Channel app. Uh, I heard you also <laughs> refer, <laughs> referring to them uh, in the last week. So we'll, t we'll touch on that. We, and then also uh, w one of the things that was competing for the title of this week's podcast is a successful what's known as a 51% attack. In this case, it was against the Ethereum classic cryptocurrency. We'll talk about that. Uh, and also a little bit of the background behind 51% attacks, which we haven't touched on for quite a while. Um, uh, I heard you mention at the end of MacBreak Weekly something else that we need to talk about, which is another court reversing mm. compelled biometric authentication. Um, we have an update on the lingering death of Flash now in hospice care. Uh, and then we'll take a look at a bit of miscellany, some errata, and finish by examining, as I mentioned at the top, uh, the implications of this recent stunning and literally headline pulling increase in bounty for the purchase of zero day vulnerabilities. So I think another great week for our listeners. That's Zerodium. That's what that's all about. Yeah. Zero deium. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Our show today brought to you as it has been so, so many years uh, by IT Pro TV, those great folks, Tim and Don, who started as IT trainers in a more traditional kind of classroom setting and then realized when they uh, heard, I was at a panel I was on at NAB that maybe they could do what we do with Twit, they could do with IT training and IT Pro TV was born. Oh, man. Oh, man. What a great way. If you love, and I know you do, Steve and these shows on Twit, you will love IT Pro TV. Imagine the best IT training from some of the best IT trainers in the world on live streaming, just like we are if you want to watch live with a chat room, or on demand in your home, on your Chromecast, on your Apple TV, on your Roku, your Fire TV, on your Apple iPhone or your Android device, on your uh, big screen, on your little screen, on your desktop, anywhere you are, just listening and soaking up all that information. If, you've, if you listen to this show, you probably have the skills you need to get an IT job. But you know what's hard? It's hard to get that first job because you, you, know, you don't have any work experience. You say, well, I listen to security now regularly. And, well, if they're a smart hiring person, they might say, oh, good, you're in. Most of the time they say, fine, kid, but where's your A-plus cert or your MCSE or your CEA? Where's your cert? And that's why people go to these expensive technical schools or sometimes they try to do it on their own. They buy all the big, thick books and they study, study, study. This is right in between. This is home study, self-study that actually works. And, by the way, it's less expensive than any of those other alternatives. IT Pro TV, what a great time to become an IT professional. Job demand is so high. And if you're and you know that if you're already an IT professional, you may say, I want to keep my job or get a better job, and IT Pro TV is great for that too. You don't have to go back to school or sit through some boring old slideshow snooze fest. We can level up with interactive and flexible IT training from IT Pro TV. For, they have five studios broadcasting live five days a week. And then Within 24 hours, they turn around those videos and they add them to their library of over 4,000 hours of binge-worthy on-demand training in every area of IT, from CompTIA and Cisco to EC Council. Those are the ones that do that certified ethical hacker cert. VMware, 
people like D Tim and Don. Don Pezzett's a great trainer. Ronnie Wong, Cherokee Booze. They prevent in present information in a uh, relax, very much like Twit. In fact, if you go, you can take a look at, uh, at go go to the site, go.itpro.tv slash security now. Take a look at it. You'll see it's fun. It's engaging. It's a great way to learn. And hands-on, too. Uh, if you have a team, if you're an enterprise, they can stream IT Pro TV's courses and live and on-demand worldwide as well. Uh, and they have a team portal, which means you can keep an eye on what they're learning. It's a lot of IT teams and big companies, universities use IT Pro TV to keep their teams up to date. So here's how you find out more. Go to the website. It's go. I, this is new. They added a go. 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 Itpro.tv slash security now. Take advantage of the biggest sale they've ever done. This is right now their video only subscription. That's the standard membership is listed on the site as it's usually $57. Right now, $29 on the site. But I can make it even better. If you use our offer code, you gotta ha you got to go to the site right. you got to go to go.itpro.tv slash security now and then use the offer code SN30. That cuts 30% off of the $29. So now you're about $20 a month to jumpstart a career in IT, to get more skills, just to have fun and learn. They've This is the lowest they've ever offered. It is a great deal. And that 30% price lasts, 30% off lasts as long as you stay active. So it is... This is, it's not just a month or a year. This is it. IT Pro TV. Gosh, I love this deal. Geo.itpro.tv slash security now. Use the code SN30 for 30% off. Flexible training, binge worthy content, life changing results. IT Pro TV. Uh, Steve, we're still a little bit uh, out of sync, I know, with your uh, your, your voice. I don't know. You're, you did, you're not using that same. Uh, Nothing's changed. Machine. Yeah, I don't know. Good old Skype. Ugh. Ugh. Anyway, it doesn't matter because most people listen, so I'm not going to be, I'm not going to worry about it. So uh, our picture of the week is just, it's one that I had in the, in my collection of, of p images that people have sent me over time. And it was apropos of one of the stories we'll be talking about. I just, I shook my head when I saw this because this is, it's for a domain reliancecp.com, and the tab is Reliance Capital Partners. And I haven't gone there recently. I don't know, no, if this is the image you get, but it it makes it very clear that they are one of those still one of those old school flash based sites. Apparently, when you go without Flash, it you get a big banner that says to enjoy this site because, of course, enjoyment is the goal. <laughs> You'll need to update your Flash player. It's easy, painless, and will take just a moment. Then, of course, they pretty much go against that by saying, one, download and install the latest version of Adobe's Flash player. Then, two, starts with, unfortunately which is really not the, the first word you want in the second <laughs> step of easy, painless, and will just take a moment. But unfortunately, you'll then need to close your web browser, which means you are unable then to <clears throat> read steps three and four because your web browser memorize is gone. Them, memorize them. <laughs> yes. Then go back to this site. And now, you know, and there is this whole issue of retention, which they're sort of fighting against here because, you know, maybe they were – hoping you would stay if you just came by mistake. But anyway, go back to this site after you restart your web browser. Uh, and then four, that's it. Have fun. And, of course, that is if you then survive uh, what what it is that having Flash uh, loaded in your system. But because obviously you didn't have it before. And in order to go to ReliancePP.com, at least when this picture was taken. No, no, uh, I just went there. This is the current site no what's really frustrating by the way <laughs> oh, that, that's boy. it what's really wow. frustrating is you don't get anything if you don't have flash i mean you don't get uh you know they don't degrade gracefully they just don't show you anything uh, so i don't know uh, so so again you know w we remember those days where somebody built an entire website in flash 
And so that's what this is, that, obviously, right? Yes, yes, exactly. And so the assumption was, eh, those browsers, you know, they they're you know, who wants text? We we want flash. And so okay. And actually this I'm I'm really tempted just to jump down. I don't even know how deep it is in our notes because I I talk about this. Uh, oh, well, we'll get there. Anyway, great picture of the week. And boy, you know, whoever you are, Reliance Capital Partners. <laughs> Clearly they don't want any viewers because I don't think, is there any modern system that has Flash on it by default? No. My Windows 10 machine doesn't. My Mac doesn't. No iOS device does. No Android device does. So basically what they're telling people is go away. Yeah, really. You know, if you're like... <laughs> visiting this <laughs> this century. I don't know who these guys oh. are, but they they mustn't get much web traffic. I bet they're really I bet they they're kind of thinking, "Gee, I wonder what happened. Maybe the internet's just kind of what was a fad after all because no one's no one's coming by it's anymore." It's a real estate investment company focused on acquiring, repositioning, or renovating and stabilizing multifamily properties. I only know that because of the Google cash. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, boy. boy. Well, that's how to make sure you don't get any business. Yeah. Um, okay, last Tuesday was the second Tuesday of the month, the earliest second Tuesday possible being the 8th. Um, and, it, and 51 vulnerabilities were fixed. So a good number of vulnerabilities for the first Patch Tuesday of the new year. Seven of them were rated critical. However, it also broke Windows file sharing for Windows 7 and its matched companion server 2008 R2. But we'll get to that in a second. First, the good news. There was a surprising DHCP vulnerability discovered internally by one of Microsoft's own uh, guys in their enterprise security group. And... It could allow an attacker to send a specially crafted DHCP response to a client to perform an arbitrary code execution. Now, that's scary because DHCP is sort of promiscuous. I mean, any, I mean, it's on all the time if you are in any normal mode where – for, especially if you have a laptop and you're roaming around, you know, when you go into the airport or the coffee shop or pretty much anywhere, it's, it's DHCP, which is reaching out and saying, hey, uh, I'm somewhere new, give me an IP. And it turns out that a, a, a malicious DHCP server could have been for Windows systems installing code on those systems. They wrote, a memory corruption vulnerability exists in the Windows DHCP client when an attacker sends specially crafted DHCP responses. An attacker who successfully exploited the vulnerability could run arbitrary code on the client machine. To exploit the vulnerability, an attacker could send a specially crafted DHCP response to the client. So the good news is they discovered it internally. They have no knowledge, you know, as opposed to it being found by one of our AV companies, you know, in the wild being used. And so hopefully foreclosed this before any got, anyone got bit by this. So that's good news about last Tuesday's updates. Uh, they also found a pair of Hyper-V vulnerabilities which could have allowed powerful escapes from the virtualized containment. Microsoft wrote to exploit the vulnerability, an attacker could run a specially crafted application on a guest operating system, meaning in one of the Hyper-V VMs, that could cause the Hyper-V host operating system to execute arbitrary code. So not only an escape that is like, you know, poking a hole, but actually getting the external Hyper-V host to do something for you. So not good, and those are closed. There were also three other uh, critical flaws were patched in the Chakra Core scripting engine, uh, which f was failing to ha handle uh, memory objects in Edge. Um, and there was also a problem in their Jet database engine, which was 
publicly disclosed but had not been observed in the wild. So all those things got fixed, and that's good, in addition to, what, 46, 7, 8 others. However, as has become all too commonplace lately, included in last Tuesday's release were two updates that caused problems connecting to network shares on Windows 7 and its server version, as I mentioned, Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, three days later, that would have been on the on Friday the 11th, Microsoft released a standalone update to resolve that problem, which had been introduced in two, by Tuesday's patches. So, first of all, if you didn't have any problem, then you're okay. Um, if you did, the two patches that caused the problems were KB4480960 and KB4480970. So you could remove those or you could install the subsequent fix, which was 4487345. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, if anybody is like hasn't known what's going on, ha you haven't dug around or find an answer, uh, I do have the link to that update in the show notes. There was also a registry fix, which I mean, because this was you know for a lot of people this was a big problem. So there was some scurrying around. A quick fix was found that involved adding an a a D word value to uh, to a key in the registry under local account token filter policy. If you did that in order to temporarily solve this problem, you should remember to take that out because you don't want to leave that in there um, and instead apply this KB 448-7345 fix. Um, also last week, Windows 7 machines being activated through Microsoft's key management service, KMS, began receiving Windows is not genuine notifications indicating that the Windows license was not valid, which, of course, you can imagine upset some of the valid Windows users. It turns out that due to its coincidence with Patch Tuesday, the initial suspicion was that Something else that Patch Tuesday had done had broken this. But it turns out that we later discovered that there was a, a, a change that Microsoft had pushed to their activation servers that broke that, which Microsoft later backed out. They wrote a recent update to the Microsoft activation and validation unintentionally caused a not genuine error on volume licensed Windows 7 clients that had, and there was some, there was some interaction there had, that had KB um, 9710, 9710033 installed. They said that the change was in, introduced at uh, 1000 UTC on January 8th and was reverted at 430 UTC on the 9th. So made a mistake, realized what had happened, and, and backed out of it. So anyway, uh, as I said, it's almost more useful now uh, deliberately holding off a week <laughs> to, to see what happened after uh, our monthly Patch Tuesdays since Microsoft has, I mean, I don't think we've had uh, one that's been uneventful for quite a while. Um, I mentioned unintended consequences to the uh, U.S. government shutdown, as our certainly as our U.S. listeners know, um, unless you were really uninvolved uh, with you know <laughs> the the news of the day, uh, at the time of this podcast, the U.S. government is partially shut down over a political funding dispute about the proper nature of the enforcement of security at our southern U.S. border. And in a classic example of unintended consequences, a growing number, somewhere around 80 as of the most recent reporting and counting that I've been able to find, uh, 80 different government websites are no longer accessible 
or have been marked as insecure connections because during this government outage, their server's TLS certificates have expired and cannot be renewed, apparently, until the government reopens. I have a shot in the show notes here of a notice. Your connection is not secure. And it says, and this was Mozilla. Uh, this was Firefox last night. It said, the owner of, and the site is OWS numeral two dot US DOJ. That is the United States Depart uh, the Department of Justice dot gov has configured their website improperly. To protect, your web, to protect your information from being stolen, Firefox has not connected to this website. This site uses, um, here's another little twist that we'll get to in a second, HTTP strict transport security, as we, we know is HSTS, to specify that Firefox may only connect to it securely. As a result, it is not possible to add an exception for this certificate. So you, ha you, the visitor of using Firefox, have no recourse. And th the, this US DOJ site was not alone. Uh, .gov websites with expired certificates, which, all, which are also on the HSTS preload list, including all of the US Department of Justice.gov subdomains are completely inaccessible by Chrome and Mozilla because um, the U.S. DOJ wanting to strengthen their security has got has has been declaring historically and has is on the preload list for these browsers. So you can only get to them this way. Um, so naturally, uh, first of all, I'm sort of surprised that this happened so quickly, but I guess, you know, certificates are constantly rolling over and needing to be renewed. Um, there was also a rockettest.nasa.gov site that is gone and a Lawrence Berkeley National Lab site, uh, d2l.lbl.gov. Uh, what's interesting is that I was curious about those. Um, because the rockettest.nasa.gov site, ex its cert expired on January 5th. And this Lawrence Berkeley National Lab site expired on the 8th. Um, they initially showed warning messages like I read before. Oh, but they did not have HSTS. So you were able to push past the warning saying, you know, I want to go there anyway. I know what I'm doing or, you know, I'll take the risk or whatever. The problem is those sites also required authentication. And so it, if you pushed past that, you were then sending your username and password credentials without encryption to the site. So even though it has apparently been impossible to issue new certs during the shutdown, at least those sites have been taken off the air. In the case of rockettest.nasa.gov, when I looked this morning, uh, DNS had been pulled from it. And the, uh, the ows2.usdoj.gov site had had its traffic blocked. So you can't get there at all. Uh, it still has valid, it's still revol it's still resolving DNS, but they said, okay, we, you know, we can at least, <laughs> pull the plug on this so that people are not trying to log in insecurely. So clearly the takeaway here is that we should learn a lesson. Uh, we're having these temporary government funding shutdowns over political disagreements now eh, relatively routinely. I think this is the third one un under the Trump administration. So, and we've broken a record in terms of its length. So, it's certainly it's a function of the size of the window during which certificates cannot get renewed. If these are now breaking length records, there's a greater opportunity for certificates to expire during this time. The good news is we always see these approaching. So I'm hoping that that this experience and the fact that we've moved the Internet forcefully 
to HTTPS connections, which is all for the better. And it's certainly good that, that sites are on the HSTS preload list so that even when they their certs expire, there's no loss of security, you, I mean, except for the fact that you can't get there. Um, but, but my point is that since we always see these these potential um, uh, uh, shutdowns approaching, it would be great if there was, you know, some look at the certs on the servers. And because we know that all of the um, certificate authorities will credit us with the amount of remaining time on a certificate when they are renewed. So there's there's no downside to renewing the cert ahead of time. It doesn't cost more money. You're not losing the um, the amount of time that was remaining on the certificate when when you renew. So I hope that that there there's enough awareness of this that that uh, the people in the government, as we see, you know, the next shutdown approaching, will say, oh, uh, gee, we only have three weeks left on this cert. Uh, and uh, that may not be enough time. So let's renew now so that the site can stay on the air. Although, frankly, I think it was, um, I remember a, a previous one where uh, several sites, you know, just put up a banner and said, we're sorry, during the uh, the funding outage or the funding dispute and the government shutdown, uh, our services are not currently available. Come back when you hear otherwise. So... Uh, anyway, uh, the good news is at least the sites that were offering you the ability to ignore security, uh, at least in the two that I looked at, they had been taken down. They were off the air, uh, which is, uh, you know, an improvement. Um, an interesting case of WhatsApp security being broken. We've we've talked about, of course, a lot about messaging security. We did a podcast on the Signal app, where, as I have said a number of times, I was as I was reading through the detailed protocol spec, I remember thinking initially, boy, this thing is over-designed. And then as I got into the details more, I realized why the bullet point features that were mentioned at the beginning were there, and I came away with a lot of respect for the Signal protocol. The problem is... It's still up to the implementer to deal with some of the details. And uh, at least WhatsApp has has failed in one way to handle some of this. This, this came to light um, on the 10th, which was what, last Thursday. Uh, an Amazon employee, Abby Fuller, tweeted, logged into WhatsApp with a new phone number today. And the message history from the previous number's owner was right there. This doesn't seem right. And apparently there was, I don't know how many people followed her. The, the, the news got out. It drew some attention to her tweets. She followed up with additional tweets. She said, "I now I'm wondering how many other times it's happened. Like, does whoever has my old number now have my WhatsApp history. And she also tweeted and in response to others, yes, it was a new device. No, it wasn't secondhand. It was not a secondhand SIM. Yes, I'm sure they weren't my messages or groups that I was added to. Yes, they were in plain text. I'm sure it's my new phone number. It was not restored from a backup. Okay, so we know what happened. Um, uh, the apparent leakage of someone else's WhatsApp messaging stream into Abby's uh, phone should raise privacy concerns. Um, um, as we know, WhatsApp uses our phone number as our authentication in lieu of username and password. The argument has been that WhatsApp only sends to that number and so our phone is our authenticating device. So the fact that, that it just uses our phone and our phone number is not a vulnerability. But what exactly happens when phone numbers change hands? 
It's clear from an online FAQ that WhatsApp is aware of this issue. The problem is that its users aren't aware and they've they've uh, that WhatsApp has made everything so simple and automatic that it's difficult to then ask users to pay attention to something that's far from obvious because its security implications have been deliberately hidden in order to make the system easy to use. On their FAQ, I've got a link to it in the show notes for anyone who's interested, they have a, a, a subject, <clears throat> changing phone numbers and or phones. And then the subhead, changing your WhatsApp phone number. Before you stop using a particular phone number, you should migrate your WhatsApp account to the new number. For a, for a simple way to do this, use our change number feature. By using this feature, you'll be able to migrate your account information, including your profile information, as well as your groups. They say, make sure your contacts delete your old number from their phone's address book and input your new number. As it is a common practice for mobile providers to recycle numbers, you should expect that your former number will be reassigned. <clears throat> In other words, <laughs> this is a complete failure of the privacy guarantees that WhatsApp is promoting as a consequence of the fact that it's phone number tied, yet people are not necessarily tied to their phone numbers when they change. So, you know, Abby's tweets indicated that the chat history she received on her new phone was, quote, not full, but actively, but I'm sorry, but definitely actual threads slash DM conversations, she said elsewhere. So we know that WhatsApp doesn't archive messaging on their servers, but we also know that, and really WhatsApp is Signal because it's, it's, it's the Signal protocol, and this is something that we explained and, and covered when I talked about the Signal protocol on our podcast of that name. Uh, we know that undelivered messages will persist in encrypted form for up to 45 days. The other problem is that once a device's SIM and phone number have been, have been used to establish the local device's encryption keys, the SIM can be removed, yet that device, now absent any cellular telephony, can continue to use the encryption keys it still has until such time as the phone number associated with its absent SIM becomes assigned to some other WhatsApp user. So... That means the binding, the real-time binding between the phone number and WhatsApp encryption is weak. I mean, there is no real-time binding. It's a, it's a first-use establishment, which, which does create a rather large window during which time there's a presumption that you're still, you still have this phone number – even though it's on a device that may have no phone number at all, no, no cellular te telephony service. And so that creates a rather glaring loophole. When you combine that with storage and catch-up delivery of pending messages, it creates an opportunity for some significant privacy leakage. So that's, the, you know, this is the way WhatsApp operates. Um, uh, oh, it also trusts new encryption keys broadcasted by a contact and uses them to automatically re-encrypt undelivered messages and send them to the recipient without informing or leaving an opportunity for the sender to verify the recipient. Again, it's doing a lot of things behind the scenes so that it just works. Unfortunately, we're seeing a perfect example of how this can be broken. And of course, this brings us back to my number one complaint about ease of use versus security and privacy trade-offs, which we inevitably encounter anytime someone else manages our keys 
for us. Um, I, I, this made me go back and visit Threema. I haven't looked at the Threema website for a while. Um, and, you know, I've always liked them because they keep this in the hands of their users. Yes, there's a little more setup in the beginning. You are asked to do, to go, you know, remember that, that Threema is the one that has the green, yellow, and red sort of stoplight signal for the level of authentication of the other person's keys that you have, you have achieved. Um, so yes, a little more setup. Also, it's not free. It's, it's a few dollars in order to purchase this. And it's not open source. Um, is it still not? No, nope. they use I NACL, been... but we don't know how they use NACL, right? Okay. Anyway, so S unfortunately, these... Signal also uses a phone number. I wish they didn't. I know, and yes, I think it's and a drawback. they do. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, they don't have the same problem WhatsApp does, I'm sure. But because once the keys right. are invalidated, they they say, well, that's that, you know. Right. So as I said at the top of the show, um, if I were to coin a phrase to be a perfect corollary to our TNO, trust no one, it would be, if you're not managing your own keys someone else is, you know, keys are the way, you know, encryption keys are the way our systems work today. They need to be somewhere and th someone needs to manage them. Someone needs to create them, uh, curate them, uh, verify them, just, you know, use them, destroy them. And if you're not doing that, then that's being done somewhere else. So, you know, again, in, in it's, a, it's a perfect corollary to trust no one. Uh, if I'm using some sort of uh, communications tool, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm, nothing I'm doing needs it. But if someone's really concerned about privacy, uh, I, you, want, you want something where you're managing your own keys. And Leo, I would agree with you that it should also be open source. And as we know, have been audited by, you know, closely looked at by by people yeah. who have an adversarial they, role. They claim just they're audited, but you have to sign an NDA to audit it. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a commercial program. Let's just yep. say it. Yep. Call a spade a spade. Yep. 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 Uh, I thought I was going to have another story about a free, um, useful ransomware decryption tool. We've been talking about those over, over the last few weeks. This one is PyLocky, P-Y-L-O-C-K-Y. -Y. Turns out, uh, <laughs> I got a kick out of the headline. It was unlock files for free. And I thought, okay, well, this is probably another encryption done wrong. Uh, turns out that's not the case. Um, you should mention it comes it from Cisco. Uh, from Talos, well, right? Yeah. Well, actually, the, their their research does. What they discovered was that uh, uh, if you happened to be capturing your network traffic. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> At the time that this thing grabbed a hold of your computer and had its communications with its command and control server so that you had a PCAP file, you know, a packet capture file of the network traffic between your machine and the command and control server because the initialization vector and the password were transiting the network at the time. Yeah. Well, the good news yeah, is... we got it. You, <laughs> <laughs> what's the problem? Yeah, you've stored it. Yeah, That's thanks funny. very much. That's but funny. Uh, I wasn't capturing my traffic. And you you might argue anybody, also that anybody who is doing, who, whoever they are, who actually has, you know, Wireshark running or some something capturing their packet traffic is probably astute enough not to get infected with this in the first place. So I'm not exactly sure what the overlap is between people who are being caught out by this ransomware and happen to have packet capture running at the same time. I, to me, this felt like, you know, oh, hey, look, uh, we were playing with this ransomware. We noticed that, oh, look, we could capture the packets and, and, and reverse the decryption. Okay, but 
you know, that isn't really going to help anybody. And other than that, the encryption was done correctly. Um, on the 9th, which was Wednesday, Google Public DNS began to support DNS over TLS. So Google has added themselves to the ranks. Uh, we know that Cloudflare has been doing this for a while. Uh, Google now is there too. In their, in their posting under their security Google blog, they said, we implemented the DNS over TLS specification along with the RFC 7766 recommendations to minimize the overhead of using TLS. These include support for TLS 1.3, they said for faster connections and improved security, TCP fast open, and pipelining of multiple queries and out of order responses over a single connection. And actually, I would argue that that's probably one of the most important things to have for DNS because the user is going to be establishing a, a semi-persistent connection to a remote DNS server. But remember that even though it's caching, you may very well be making queries for DNS domains that it doesn't have in its cache, meaning that it's going to go ha it's going to have to go out and recursively resolve the the that query in order to get for you the IP address that you're asking for. If you're going to a web page where oh my god, you know, <laughs> this scores of domains are now uh, appearing on individual web pages that creates a flood of DNS queries. So you're definitely not going to want to wait for an in order resolution of DNS. You're going to, you really need out of order resolution. So you need to be able to dump a whole bunch of queries onto that remote DNS server and start getting answers back immediately for domains, for, for IPs that it has in its cache while it goes out and looks for other things so that you can get those back and start making your queries and not be stuck in a, in a, in a serialized pipeline. So that's all for the good. They also note, this is Google, of course, that Android 9 uh, Pi uh, users can use DNS over TLS today. Um, so uh, I dug down a little bit because I was curious to see like where we are on in the state of the, the, the deployment of this. Uh, and so um, what they have is known as a stub resolver. The, the stub resolver is it, essentially it replaces the, the or I, I guess I would say it pro, it, it's, it's a local proxy for DNS. So it's, it's a little resolver that runs on your, on your whatever, on your smartphone in the case of Android. Uh, there are stub resolvers for other platforms. I'll get to in a second. But so, so what it does is it, it rewrites your DNS servers to itself. So typically, you know, 127.0.0.1, you know, the local host. So it creates a local DNS server on your machine so that your machine then makes queries to it and which it then proxies out securely uh, o over to the DNS server, the the DNS over TLS server that it's been configured with. Um, in their notes, they explained that the stub resolver is configured with DNS over TNS resolver name DNS.google in their case. The stub resolver obtains the IP addresses for DNS.google using the local DNS resolver because, of course, first it's got to get the IP of where it's going. It makes a, a TCP connection to port 853. As we know, 53 is the normal port for DNS. So this is 853 at one of the IP addresses that it has, it has received, received from the normal DNS resolver. Uh, it, it then initiates a TLS handshake with the Google public DNS resolver and 
the Google public DNS server returns its TLS certificate along with a full chain of TLS certificates which chain up to a trusted root certificate. So the, the stub resolver verifies the server's identity based on the certificates that it receives over the TLS connection. If the identity cannot be validated, the name resolution fails and the stub resolver returns an error. So naturally, you want to make sure that, you're, that you are connecting to the real DNS.Google server and that you're not subject to any sort of spoofing because the whole, you know, not only are you hoping to get privacy by by running your DNS over TLS, but you're also wanting to to uh, solve the problem of DNS spoofing through any sort of a man in the middle attack or interception. As we know, DNS over UDP provides essentially no protection for that because you have. Uh, if, if someone can somehow get into your connection, it's trivial to spoof DNS. This solves that problem, but you want to make sure that your other end is anchored at the at, at, at the real trusting or trustable uh, DNS server. And so, after the TNS, the TLS connection is established, the stub resolver then has a secure communications path between you and Google's public DNS server. Uh, over which these queries can be sent. So we have DOH, which is the the acronym or the abbreviation of of DNS over HTTPS. Uh, Chrome and Firefox already support that. So that gives us already a lot of these benefits. But as we know, our our computer systems are doing lots of DNS queries also. So DNS over HTTPS supported by our browsers only solves the problem for browsing. DNS over TLS, if our OS has a has a a, a DOT resolver, that is DNS over TLS, then our whole system gets protected and all of the DNS queries that are being made are going to be uh, running over TLS. And so long as the, the, the DNS uh, over TLS server is giving us good performance and is well connected and is nearby, uh, uh, it can run very quickly and we get, uh, uh, you know, absolute uh, uh, authentication of the queries subject to its security uh, and privacy so that nobody can see uh, what we're doing. There is dnsprivacy.org for anyone who is interested. There are now resolvers. There, there's a stub resolver for Mac and Linux and Windows. They're still in the early stages of development, but this would allow somebody who really wanted that kind of privacy. Now that we're seeing some good uh, heavyweight support for uh, DOL, DNS over TLS, uh, to get uh, privacy for all of their systems DNS lookups. So, yay. And Leo, time That's for a break number two. Indeed, and we welcome a new sponsor. Well, in a way, it's a new sponsor. In One way, oft, mentioned, oft mentioned on this podcast. Absolutely, and... Uh, in a way, a return of an old sponsor. Because remember, our first sponsor was Astaro. The Astaro right. Security Gateways. Very, very first sponsor. Right. They're now owned by Sophos. So in a way, it's just the return of our original sponsor under a new <laughs> new name, Sophos Cybersecurity. We've talked about Sophos. They're using a deep learning technology, a very advanced uh, AI technology that's basically a neural network. Uh, to interpret data and respond to threats at blazing speed. This is actually a very interesting use of neural networks. Using this technology, Sophos was just ranked number one by an independent security test that was done by SE Labs with the best protection ratings across the board for large enterprises and small businesses. Of course, we use Sophos gear ourselves. Sophos recently took this amazing advanced technology that protects millions of business users and made a version, a premium version, available for Macs and PCs. Sophos Home, this is brand new, delivers real-time protection from the latest ransomware attacks, 
malicious software hacking attempts, and more. Very easy to use, whether you're just securing your own laptop or managing the security of a bunch of devices on your own network or even all around the world. It's used by so many uh, enterprises. Now you can sign up for a single account and protect all your Macs and PCs from a single console. It is cloud-based. I like that because it means it's always kept up to date. And this is really cool. In fact, I might try this. You can use it to keep relatives secure, like my mom, even if they're thousands of miles away. You can remotely manage their security, clean up threats, and keep their system safe. That's pretty attractive. Sophos's tagline, security made simple. That says it all right there. The whole thing, very easy to use. You log in from your browser and you start securing your systems today. So, pretty neat, huh? Whether you're a large enterprise or a home user or the keeper of security for your family, Sophos has you covered. In fact, some of the largest businesses in the world used Sophos to stay protected from those uh, big ransomware attacks last year. They were safe. Third-party reviewers consistently rank Sophos among the best cybersecurity providers. And with their synchronized serve security, you can manage all your products from a single cloud-based console. You can do it right now. Uh, we've recommended this before. Sophos.com has a free security scan. Very, very high quality security scan, S-O-P-H-O-S dot com. Or while you're there, get a free trial of Sophos and their new deep learning uh, technology, S-O-P-H-O-S dot com. Security made simple. And we thank Sophos for being on the show. It's kind of a, a kind of nice, right? I like to get hey, security yes, products very, out here. Yeah. Very. Back to you, Steve. Their paper is titled, A First Look at the Crypto Mining Malware Ecosystem, A Decade of Unrestricted Wealth. And of course, we're all familiar with the expression, crime doesn't pay. The point, I think, is that getting caught eventually makes any crime, which may have appeared to be going along nicely, right up until that point, suddenly a source of regret. Um, that adage would certainly apply to those who are behind efforts to steal others' computing resources for the mining of cryptocurrency. We've been talking about cryptocurrency mining now for, well, uh, uh, browser insertion. Uh, for a while, uh, websites were voluntarily putting the script on their sites, you know, like in lieu of advertising to say, hey, while you're here, we'd like to borrow some of your uh, processor or GPU in order to mine some 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 coin for ourselves. Anyway, these guys, uh, two researchers, uh, I'm trying to look for it in my show notes. I don't see uh, where they are. I have the their original research uh, link uh, in the the show notes. In their abstract, they said illicit crypto mining leverages resources stolen from victims to mine cryptocurrencies on behalf of criminals. While recent works have analyzed one side of this threat, i.e. web browser crypto jacking, only white papers and commercial reports have partially covered binary-based crypto mining malware. In this paper, we conduct the largest measurement of crypto mining malware to date, analyzing approximately 4.4 million malware samples. They said 1 million malicious miners over a period of 12 years from 2007 to 2018. Our analysis pipeline applies both static and dynamic analysis to extract information from the samples, such as wallet identifiers and mining pools. Together with open source intelligence data, this information is used to group samples into campaigns. We then analyze publicly available payments sent to the wallets from mining pools as a reward for mining and estimate profits from the different campaigns. Um, our profit analysis reveals campaigns with multi-million dollar earnings associating over 4.3% of Monero with illicit mining. So what, one in 25, over 4.3%. We analyzed the infrastructure related with the different campaigns, showing that a high proportion of this ecosystem is supported by underground economies, such as pay-per-install services. 
We also uncover novel techniques that allow criminals to run successful campaigns. So what's the cash out value of 4.3% of Monero? $53 million. Wow. <laughs> yes, exactly, Leo. Um, unfortunately, we know that money is what drives this. And if you've got a $53 million paycheck on the other side of, of figuring out how to get mining on other people's hardware, the, there you have a lot of incentive to do so. And unfortunately, one of the, the themes we come we keep coming back to here is the degree to which security is porous. Um, we've seen instances, where, for example, where routers are compromised in order to install crypto mining on any browsers that they're able to perform an injection on behind the browser. I mean, behind the router. So it's just, you know, in aggregate, we're looking at $53 million spread out among these campaigns. And in fact, in their outlook for 2019, Checkpoint Security sees cryptocurrency stealing software continuing to be the number one most commonly distributed form of malware. That is, it is in that they have a top 10 list and all of the top slots in Checkpoint's top 10 list are filled with cryptocurrency miners. CoinHive continues to be the most prominently distributed malware, followed by XM Rig, um, both which use the victim computer to mine Monero with the profits directed into the cryptocurrency wallet of the attacker. Um, that Those two are followed by JSE Coin, which is a JavaScript miner embedded into websites, and then the not very imaginatively named Crypto Loot, uh, which is a direct competitor to CoinHive. Crypto Loot was second only to CoinHive last November, but since then its distribution has dropped a bit. So, I mean, the this is the where the pressure is at the moment. I guess it's somewhat better than it being, um, uh, you know, uh, ransomware, which is encrypting all of someone's drive, uh, you know, the, the files on their entire computer. Still, um, uh, it's sort of nickel and diming people. Uh, if, if you get it into your phone, it runs your battery down. We've seen instances where it's causing phones to overheat because it's pushing them so hard. Um, those things tend to give away the presence of something that's gone wrong in one's computer, and then you know you 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 scan it with some so some some um, AV software and and figure out what's going on. But it does say that that's what what the what the bad guys are trying to do is just get this stuff into your machine any way possible. And of course, advertising is one of the ways this happens because our browsers are 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 pulling in ads from from everywhere and that and those ads are then able to run javascript on our machine and unless there's something unless there's proactive measures being taken to prevent those ads from consuming undue resources there's some slight chance that they're going to uh be mining cryptocurrency and score uh, a, a fraction of a coin or or be part of a mining pool in which case it's just incremental wins um and speaking of uh, top 10 lists, Avast's uh, threat landscape report for 2019 is out. Um, it was a 20 page, a 26 page report. Um, I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but one topic that that has been a big one for us all of 2017 uh, in the Internet of Things section was a subsection on router-based attacks stating that the worst is yet to come. Um, it may not surprise anybody, but you know we've talked about how porous our routers are and how and unfortunately subject to compromise. Um, in their report, I won't go through it in detail. If anyone's interested, I, I pulled the whole section out. It's in the show notes. Uh, because we've been covering it to such degree. Their research, however, shows 
that 60% of users around the world have never updated their router's firmware. And while we can hope that newer routers are, and I want to believe that newer routers are doing a better job, that there's this pressure from the routers to, to enable lots of features. And one things, one of the trends we are seeing is routers becoming an increasingly sophisticated, offering an increasing number of features and those features ending up biting people. So, uh, all of our listeners know you want to make sure you do not have universal plug and play exposed publicly. You want to have it disabled on the LAN side because it can be abused if you know you don't need it. If you can disable it, you want it disabled. And as I mentioned last week, uh, it really is worthwhile, especially if you if your router is a few years old, uh, to go out and make sure that there isn't newer firmware available. And you really ought, ought, ought to, if you can, purchase a router from a reputable source. Um, they mentioned that, that, that they said we um, they're talking about uh, an increase in router-based malware in 2018. They said they've also seen changes in the characteristics of the attacks where router-based malware has traditionally taken over a device for the purpose of carrying out a DDoS. In other, in other words, we talked about that earlier in 2017 where they were, they were using UPN proxy in order to bounce packets off of routers in order to just distribute their attacks. Uh, the, you know, the uh, Mirai botnet was doing that. Uh, Avast said that today's attacks use malware that infects a device and then opens up a line of communication to a command and control server without taking any immediate action. They said, we saw this with VPN filter. Remember, that's the malware that the FBI alerted everyone to and said, please reboot your routers, bizarrely enough, because it, it, if, if, you did, if you did that, you would at least flush it out of RAM. Temporarily. Uh, exactly, temporarily. Once the router is infected, these machine, these malware strains, they wrote, listen to the network traffic, fingerprint the network and the devices behind it and allow for the command and control server to send new payloads or instructions to the devices. So basically, it's elevated itself to an advanced persistent threat style infection of a, of a router. And they said in this, the, mal the malware acts more like a platform and less like a virus. They said this platformification of IoT malware opens up many possibilities for bad actors who can repurpose it for a multitude of nefarious activities, including pay per install, DDoS for hire, crypto mining, or even good old fashioned spam. They wrote this evolution replicates how PC malware counterparts have evolved and indicates the sophistication of new strains of IoT targeted malware. So I, I guess I, I don't think it's possible to overstress the fact that, you know, we talk about attack surfaces a lot. The, you know, the you know, one reason to be wary about A V, as we've as we've discussed, is that it can present an attack surface and an increased attack surface because if it's trying to scan everything coming in, if there's if the A V itself has made any mistakes, it can increase the the opportunity for compromise. Well, there is no larger attack surface than our router. That's the that is the face of our network to the internet. So absolutely keep it secure. And I wanted to mention also that uh, I was just shopping recently for uh, what, I, what I went looking for was NetGate's SG-1000, which is that it's this cute little tiny box, uh, no moving parts, uh, just two network interfaces, a WAN and a LAN. What's significant about it is that it's a perfect platform for running PFSense, which is my favorite and chosen platform because it is completely open. 
open source, and it's running free BSD and literally anything you can imagine that you might want to, to run on it will. Um, anyway, I found that it had been discontinued, um, and but it's been replaced with the SG-1100. They uh, the, the price is $159, so it's not a $49 piece of plastic, but it is, I mean, it's what you want if you want something secure on your perimeter where you know what software uh, is running in it uh, and, and you know, a, a platform that can, can grow with you. I'm using it to establish persistent VPN links using o o OpenVPN. Um, but I've all, I'm also doing port mapping, translating from one port to another in order to avoid some of the things that my, my, that my local ISP is doing and a bunch of other things. Um, anyway, I just wanted to point people to it. Uh, the SG-1100 has got five times the packet processing performance of the SG-1000. So uh, it turns out that the, the trade tariffs in, was forced the price to go up a little bit, but you're getting five times the performance. It's got three one gig interfaces. So if you're interested in setting up a segmented network, this supports that fully. Um, and it is also the first product equipped with microchips crypto authentication device, which provides assurance that the system is running authentic, unaltered PFSense software. So the software itse itself is signed by PFSense, and when you download it, it's verified and cannot be changed. So anyway, just a, I, uh, on the topic of routers, uh, I was poking around looking for something, and I, I first of all, I was sorry to see that the SG-1000 was gone, but I ended up with an SG-1100, which gives me an extra Ethernet interface and five times the performance, uh, which is good because, as we know, uh, our 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 cable modems um, are increasing in speed. So, do you then hook this up to a Wi-Fi access point, or how do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the so the cable modem plugs into its WAN interface, and then uh, then I I just t I turn what was my Wi-Fi router into a an access point. Uh, typically, they're able to run either way, and and I plug that in. Uh, to the land side so in the, order to all get the DHCP access. is performed by the SG1100. Yes. yes, yes, and for example, you can run a DNS server there. You can run DNS over TLS there. So it could provide. So it could be running your DNS over TLS proxy connected to the strong DNS. Uh, provider of your choice, and then all of your devices just use DHCP, get it as their as the DNS provider, and your entire network then is doing DNS secure. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, as, as 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 an example of a perfect use case for this, it's just it's a perfect little uh, free BSD box, and there it is. It's a cute little thing. It's too. not really a you know, box. <laughs> it looks more like no. an Altoids tin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just barely big enough to hold the the connectors that it needs. Yeah, yeah, that's it really just that's really cool. So, would you recommend you'd recommend this over the Edge Router? I mean, this this is what the Edge Router X does, kind of. Yeah, it's got PS I like, Sense built in. Yes, it's got uh, this has a beautiful web interface. the The problem with the Edge Router is that it really, I mean, you got to really have your propeller wound tightly. Uh, on on your beanie uh, in order to deal with the edge router. It is the edge router is very powerful, but it isn't easily configurable. Yeah. This is really the 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 it, ha, it has a you know you you log in with with a browser, and it's got a beautiful web based GUI where you're able to to you know uh, fill out forms, uh, create static and dynamic mappings. Uh, uh, set up connections. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just amazing. It's got packet capture. You're able to do, you know, how in um, Linux you have a top that shows the 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 uh, assorted list of processes mm -hmm. by how much power, by, by how much processing time they're using. You have the same thing for your network, so you can see what connections 
out to the outside world are using how much bandwidth in order to to monitor what your entire network is doing. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It is for, for someone who wants to play with their network. Uh, I can't I couldn't recommend anything better than this. Oh, I might have to get it. It's the a only cutie. problem is the the mesh routers that I use like to be their own DHCP server. So well, and it, this doesn't prevent them from doing that. So you could put this they, in bridge mode, or you could have double uh, NAT. You could have double. Well, so they want to be they DHCP or NAT. Oh, I always use those interchangeably. They're not. No, DHCP is dynamic host configuration, which is you know giving uh, machines IP, IP, address. IP addresses yeah, and yeah. so forth. NAT, of course, is 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 stateful routing of of packets across. Typically, those are in the same in, in the same box. I understand but they the would, different functions. They, they wouldn't yeah, need to yeah, be. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you have to let it do NAT for it to do the pfSense functionality. Otherwise, it couldn't really. You know, well, do you packet could inspection. you could do you could do st uh, you could it set it up as a bridge, in which case it it would have some functions, but it would really, as you say, it would make more sense for it to it, it to run your network. It do and, that, and then you let the yeah. uh, Eero do the DHCP. I don't know if I can do that, but I'll try. Yeah, that sounds that interesting. Would be interesting. Yeah. yeah, a lot of these uh, you know uh, mesh routers want to see all the traffic because they want to do QoS. They want to be able to control it more uh, directly, as opposed to just right. being a dumb, you know, access point or radio. Yep, that does make sense. Yeah. So, I want to say right up front that I get it that not everybody is going to is going to be concerned about this, but as an indication of where, eh, you know, practice and the law are colliding, I think this was interesting and. It does. There is a sort of a little bit of a creep factor in this, also, uh, and I, you know, tongue in cheek, I call this a cloudy forecast for the Weather Channel app. Um, the The city of Los Angeles has sued the Weather Channel, claiming that it's been posing as a personalized local weather data alerts and forecasts app, but they say, in truth makes profits by tracking users throughout the day and night selling their private personal location data. And I, and I should say, th that's my favorite app. It's the one I use. I like it. Um, it even though it's not necessarily super accurate, I'm, I'm a little bit seduced by the fact that you can touch the today and tomorrow and see a, a, a guess about what the weather is going to be hour by hour which is just sort of seductive. Um, anyway, this lawsuit, uh, which was brought by, and I have it lower in my show notes, uh, uh, Dominic Ventuo, uh, uh, Venuto, I guess, General, no, no, he, <laughs> he's on the other side. Okay, I'll just stick with, with, with what I have here. Uh, uh, the lawsuit calls the weather company's practices fraudulent and deceptive and says they violate California's unfair competition law. The uh, TWC fails to disclose that it collects users' location data and sends it to third parties the suit maintains. So the city of L.A. says, quote, it, it isn't about analyzing the clouds above our heads for a personalized weather forecast. Rather, it's about collecting location data for advertising and other commercial purposes unrelated to weather data, alerts, and forecasts. None of the marketing purposes of collecting geolocation data are disclosed on either Apple's App Store or Google's Android Play Store uh, uh, and in their versions of the free app, which is also available in an ad-free version for $3.99, notes the lawsuit. Now, first of all, I didn't know you could buy it for 4 bucks and be free of the ads. Now I'm tempted to do so because you can see how concerned I am about being... <laughs> I guess you don't about, care, do you? <laughs> about, about being tracked, yeah. <laughs> Take a look at uh, Dark Sky on iOS. That's another very good app that does much the same thing. You know, oh, IBM yeah, this, owns the weather company. This is an IBM yes, company. It, Yes, and they're not happy yeah. about being about being sued by this. Um, what was a little the, the thing that was a little creepy is that the 
one of the in the lawsuit they did some digging and they found that this do, uh, uh, Dominic Ventuo the, is the who is the general manager of the consumer division at TWC admitted in an interview that quote if a consumer is using your product and says hey wait a minute why do they want to know where I am because it isn't an organic fit with the app, you're going to have some problems. But wait, wait a minute. It is an organic fit with the app. It's a weather app. Yes, and but that's the point. The, the, uh, the whole idea is this is about tracking your location uh, in, under the guise of providing you weather information. But it needs your location to give you the weather information. It does. So, yes, but 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 so but his point is that well so okay so what they found I mean I was could see if you know I don't know uh, a music app wanted to know your location which by the way they all do that you might be well why does it need to know that for play music for me Exactly and so that so that's the point is he was acknowledging oh, I see. that yeah. that that by being a weather app it's not going to raise suspicion that 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 they want to know where you are uh, and again, so so that that was the point he was making. So last month, the New York Times investigation found that um, the Weather Channel was, first of all, as we know, it's a big pack. As you just noted, music apps do the same thing. Was one of at least seventy-five companies getting purportedly anonymous but pinpoint precise location data. And this is what I heard you mention when you were talking about this earlier, Leo. Like within you know, feet of where you're located um, from about 200 million smartphones across the U S um, in, in the, in their coverage of it, they said they're often sharing it or selling it to advertisers, retailers, or even hedge funds that are seeking valuable insights into consumer behavior. As one example, a company known as tell all digital, which is a long Island based advertising firm buys location data then uses it to run ad campaigns for personal injury lawyers that it markets to people who are in emergency rooms. So the point is that the location data is that precise that they're able to they're able to determine if you're in a an emergency room of a hospital and if so arranged no I'm sure in the whole advertising bidding deal arranged to to serve you personal injury lawyer ads uh, because you may be in the in the in the mood for needing one at that time so anyway uh, I'll just note that iOS gives us good control over how when we are, are feeding apps location data and that you're able to say you know blackout location data completely for an app let it have us, you know, let it know where we are all the time or only while we're using the app. So, and I presume that means only when it's in the foreground and has not been put to sleep by, you know, having been switched to the background. So, uh, and for what it's worth, you know, these things are very accurate. They're accurate to within a few yards and in some cases are, are, tracking us 14,000 times a day. So basically creating a continuous stream of where we go uh, over time. So again, Leo, as I said, I'm thinking of deleting it so that I can re so I can purchase the $4 version and get it without ads. But if dark skies is doing the same thing, I will, uh, I'm probably switch to that. So it's dark skies. Yeah. I like that one a lot. Okay. That's the old, cool. um, Forecast.io, and uh, yeah, I think okay. it's good. Good, yeah, good. In fact, I'm I think you I might even that. like it better. And the there's doc, no way. I'm ads. glad I got that tip. Yeah. I will yeah. check it out. And, and, and uh, is it a for purchase? Or yeah, I think also... it's a few bucks. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I'm happy to pay. I'd rather you know to... if you don't pay, you gotta wonder. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Who's paying? <laughs> exactly. Somebody's paying. Somebody's paying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the Ethereum. Uh, Classic blockchain was hit, um, I think it began on the 5th, I've got it in the notes and we'll come to it, uh, with 
and and ex- with what is an expensive fi- known as 51% attack. Um, when this podcast first described the detailed operation of the Bitcoin blockchain in what was actually a classic podcast for us, because uh, I remember I you know dug into it, oh, it was great. Uh, and oh. read that so, so, and read Satoshi's original white paper, and I was I you just were raving was, about it. You oh thought, my this goodness, thing's amazing! This is the coolest thing yeah. I've ever encountered. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? You were right because blockchain. You know, you can weigh in or out on cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, yep. but blockchain, there's no doubt, is a very uh, valuable innovation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we mentioned that one of the key assumptions, in, in fact, the cornerstone assumption for the security and trustworthiness of any uh, proof of work blockchain based technology is a large community pool of honest participants who mutually concur and authenticate blockchain events. It says that? Because that really rules it. If I'd seen that, I would have said, oh, this will never work. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's well, got to be yeah. honest? <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, that's my uh, jargon. Oh, that's your line. Pa- All right. <laughs> pa- page three of Satoshi's original white paper, which was titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system, it stated, quote, if a majority of CPU power is controlled by honest nodes, the honest chain will grow the fastest and outpace any oh, competing chain. That's intriguing. So he understood even, you know, before this had happened, when it was just a white paper, that this was important. So stated another way, the block for the blockchain to remain secure, no single actor must ever be able to obtain a majority of the chain's total processing power because someone who is able to dominate the chain rules the chain. Uh-oh. And uh-huh. And is thus able to cheat others. And that's what has been happening since January 5th to the Ethereum Classic blockchain. At the expense, that is, they had to expend significant computation, but they ex- at the expense of significant computation, which was expended, attackers have been able to rewrite history. They rolled back and reorganized the Ethereum classic blockchain and were thus able to double spend by recovering previously spent coins and transferring them to a new entity. I've got a link in the show notes to the coinbase.com blog. Coinbase's security engineer, Mark Nesbitt, wrote in the blog about these events. He said, quote, the, f- the function of mining is to add transactions to the universal shared transaction history known as the blockchain. This is done by producing blocks, which are bundles of transactions, and defining the canonical history of transactions as the longest chain of blocks. If a single miner has more resources than the entirety of of the rest of the blo- of the network this miner could pick an arbitrary previous block from which to extend an alternate block history eventually outpacing the block history produced by the rest of the network and defining a new canonical transaction history so and that's what happened they posted a timeline Late on the evening of Saturday, January 5th, our systems, he wrote, alerted us to a deep reorg in ETC that contained a double spend. Our on-call engineers responded to the alert and worked to confirm the report through the night. We determined that we would temporarily halt send receive interaction with the etc blockchain 
in order to safeguard customer funds. This meant that customers who tried to send or receive ETC on Coinbase Consumer or Pro were unable to complete their transactions. On the morning of Sunday, January 6th, we posted an update on status.coinbase.com. And Leo, you should go there. Stating that due to unstable network conditions on the Ethereum Classic Network, we have temporarily disabled all sends and receives for ETC. Buy and sell is not impacted. All other systems are operating normally. We performed an analysis on Sunday afternoon and evening to confirm the pattern and determine the key details of the double spend attacks. Beginning Sunday afternoon, we observed eight more incidents, all containing double spends. Out of an abundance of caution, we did not put out a blog post prior to legal and technical review. A false alarm could have inadvertently caused market instability. On Monday, January 7th um, morning, after legal and technical review, we finalized our public analysis and posted to our blog and social media accounts. And, of course, that went into the news. I didn't I didn't put in the show notes. It is there on status.coinbase or in this blog posting, the individual breakout of double spends, which ended up um, ended up. I thought I had it. Oh, yeah, here it is. Two hundred and nineteen thousand five hundred previously spent coins wow. were respent netting the attackers $1.1 million wow. in ETC. And on that page that, that you showed, uh, of note is the fact that right now, today, everything is green except that one. Yeah. ETC is still uh, their, their buy and sell or their, their uh, send and receive is still uh, disabled. Uh, and they, they have it down for maintenance, unquote. But really what's happened is uh, we don't, that we don't control it anymore. <laughs> it's gone. Ethe yes. Uh, sure. That Ethereum uh, chain can no longer be trusted. Now, this is uh, not this is a fork of Ethereum, Ethereum Classic. Yes, it's uh, the classic. didn't affect so, Ethereum. Correct. So the real question is, yeah, you know, obviously it's a smaller cryptocurrency. Could this happen to Bitcoin or one of the bigger ones? That well, would be awfully it, hard to do, right? Yes, it has. Historically, it's happened in the past. There, there was a 51% attack. I mean, th these are generically called 51% attacks on blockchains because, for exactly this reason, as as Satoshi observed, uh, it you you have to have a you have to have a majority of honest uh, uh, nodes involved in validating these transactions if any one entity obtains majority control they're able to take over and we've um, in, in the past we've touched on this where there it's been like at risk there there have been single entities that sort of were approaching 50, like 50 percent and people that got people worried uh and th there there were brief play, uh, instances where someone had more than uh, than 50%. They had a majority. But as you note, the bigger these get, the more they sprawl, and then the more difficult it becomes for any one actor to obtain a majority. So there is safety in size because it's just, you know, it just becomes a, a, an insane amount of processing power in order to pull this off. But uh, it can happen. And Leo... Time for our last break. I like how you always begin your sentence with and Leo. Then I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is my turn to speak about our sponsor, a sponsor we use, and I know many of you use. Uh, we say it kind of with pride. We're an Atlassian house, an Atlassian shop. Atlassian. It is a collaboration software company. Anybody who's in the software business probably knows Atlassian especially because of Jira, which is kind of dominant 
in agile development. But it's a collaboration software company for teams in IT, in DevOps, developers. Um, it empowers teams everywhere all around the world. It is really a great company. Let me let me just go to Atlassian, as you should, .com, because the list of products Atlassian has is long and growing. And so it's a, it's worth kind of visiting their website and reading more. It's not just for developers. I think sometimes people think that. But it is a really an affordable, reliable set of tools for teams of all sizes. We use Jira software, of course. Jira is the ultimate and the original agile software designed to plan, track, and release software. Then there's Bitbucket, which is a great code sharing uh, uh, tool for coding, building, and shipping products. We use that, but we don't use it as much as we use Confluence. That's where we document everything. Confluence lets you organize your work, create documents, discuss everything in one place. Very powerful. They recently acquired Trello. I know you know Trello and Trello boards. They're great. Jira Service Desk, Source Tree, which is kind of Git and Mercurial in one application. Jira Ops, this is relatively new stuff. Ops Genie and Status Page help teams better detect incidents, alert response teams. Uh, just fantastic stuff. And the thing is, it all works together. It's all very affordable. And whatever you're in, if, you know, if, you, if you're DevOps or you're Agile or you're IT Ops or you're ITSM, it, you know these names, I know. And the idea of everything integrating seamlessly with Jira and Confluence and it's very affordable. In fact, it makes it easy to set it up and free to try. So why not try Atlassian today? Unleash your IT team's potential. A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N dot com. IT is really these days at the center of every operation. And the software that you use is important. Not only that it gets the job done and be efficient, but it, that the teams enjoy using it. And uh, I have to say, we love it. We've been very, very happy. Atlassian for IT. Unleash your IT team with Atlassian's collaboration software tools. Easy and free to try at Atlassian.com. Steve Gibson. Back with so, you. a court recently ruled that we needn't give law enforcement the finger. I, I mean, our, <laughs> our finger. Our finger. Our finger or face. So or Thomas, Bruce, <laughs> Thomas Brewster, who is Forbes cybersecurity reporter, yesterday ran a story with the headline, Feds can't force you to unlock your iPhone with finger or face, judge rules. Uh, a California judge has ruled that American uh, law enforcement, uh, uh, Thomas wrote cops, can't enforce people, can't can't force people to unlock a mobile phone with their face or finger. The ruling goes further to protect people's private lives from government searches than any before and is being hailed as a potentially landmark decision. Now, of course, we've talked about this at length, whether uh, where, for example, what what was the the standing law before was you could not be compelled to divulge something you knew like a password because that was being called testimonial, but something you were like your face, your thumbprint, your iris, whatever was, you know, was not testimonial. So that, so under that argument, uh, you could be compelled to produce your fingerprint to unlock a device. Um, so this order can, and again, you know, this is the most recent order. It's not that there is no last word until this thing goes to the Supreme Court for final uh, judgment. This order came from the U.S. District Court for the Northern California, for the Northern District of California, in the denial of a search warrant for an unspecified property in Oakland. The warrant was filed as part of an investigation into a Facebook extortion crime in which a victim was asked to pay up or have an embarrassing video of them publicly released. The, the, the police had some suspects in mind and wanted to raid their property. 
In doing so, the feds also wanted to open up any phone on the premises via facial recognition, a fingerprint, or I don't, I don't know of any phone that uses an iris, but that was in there too. While the judge, <clears throat> excuse me, while the judge agreed that investigators had shown probable cause to search the property, they did not have the right to open all devices inside by forcing unlocks with biometric features. On the one hand, the magistrate judge, which was uh, Candace Westmore, ruled the request was overbroad as it was neither limited to a particular person nor a particular device. So they were just saying, whatever we find of whoever's it happens to be, we want to be able to you know, see inside it. But in a more significant part of the ruling, Judge Westmore declared that the government did not have the right, even with a warrant, to search to sorry, to force suspects to incriminate themselves by unlocking their devices with biological features. And as we know, previously courts had decided the biometric features, unlike passcodes, were not testimonial. That was because a suspect would have to willingly and verbally give up a passcode, which is not the case with biometrics. A password was therefore deemed testimony, but body parts were not, and so not granted Fifth Amendment protection uh, uh, against self-incrimination. Um, so then this created a paradox. How could a passcode be treated differently from a face or finger when any of the three could be unused to lock, could be used to unlock a device and expose a private a user's private life. So, where we are now is that Judge Westmore focused there on her ruling. Uh, she declared that technology is outpacing the law, writing that fingerprints and face scans were not the same as physical evidence when considered in a context where those body features would be uh, would be used to unlock a phone. So in, or, in other words, specifically saying that for the case of unlocking, these are being held as different. Um, so anyway, I, as I said, uh, this is a flip from where we've been, but you know, various judges that we have, as we have seen in various parts of the country, make various decisions based upon you know their their particular reading of 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 the case and specific examples. I think it's going to take you know the Supreme Court ultimately to make a decision of as we move forward about what is and is not usable for uh, for unlocking our devices and. Uh, you know, who knows the way it'll come down. We're, we're seeing, we're seeing judgments now on both sides. Um, Firefox 69 will finally disable Adobe flash plugin by default. In which case our picture of the week company is pretty much SOL. They're finally going to have to have somebody design a regular website for them rather than asking people to go download flash in order to, to use their site. Um, the flash plugin is the last remaining NP API. The NP API is believe it or not, the Netscape plugin application programming interface. Yes. Netscape, uh, brought to us, Back in 1995, with Netscape Navigator 2.0, um, it was later adopted by other browsers. Uh, the developer.chrome.com site says of NPAPI, quote, NPAPI plugin support for extension has been discontinued. The documentation below is, re is preserved for historical purposes only. So, you know, Chrome wants nothing to do with this. And at this point, Flash is the only thing still using the NP API, which Firefox reluctantly continues to support. Uh, over on developer.chrome, it says, warning, NP API, and I'm not making this up. It says, is a really big hammer that should only be used 
when no other approach will work. Code running in an NPAPI plugin has the full permissions of the current user and is not sandboxed or shielded from malicious input by Google Chrome in any way. You should be especially cautious when processing input from untrusted sources, such as when working with content scripts, gee, like a web browser, or XML HTTP request, the H the XHR, you know, the standard way that JavaScript reaches out and performs queries doing Ajax and so forth. Because of the additional security risks NPAPI poses to users, extensions that use it will require manual review before being accepted in the Chrome Web Store. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's still there. If, but really, try, try not to need it. So, of course, this is why continued Flash support is so inherently dangerous. Flash uses the NPAPI, which is non-sandboxed, which means that anything that gets into your Flash uses one of its many security vulnerabilities. I mean, we know there's, there's still got to be there because anytime anyone looks, someone finds some. Uh, would allow uh, malicious uh, activity in your browser. So uh, it's not sandboxed because sandbox didn't exist and you could argue was not needed back in 1995. We were just lucky that our computers booted back then. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and sometimes they didn't. Right. So once Flash has been disabled by default in Firefox, users will not be prompted to enable Flash, but they even then they will be able to activate Flash on certain sites using browser settings. So this crazy company does does continue to operate is able to operate through 2019. Um, the final step for Flash on Firefox is due in early 2020 when Adobe also officially end of life's Flash and completely removes it from the consumer versions, and it is completely removed from the consumer versions of Firefox. Flash will continue to be supported in the Firefox extended support release, the ESR version, until the end of 2020. Um, and in 2021, Firefox will refuse to load the plugin completely. So uh, Microsoft will also be disabling Flash by default in Edge and IE uh, in mid to late 2019, so mid to late this year. Google will be, dis will be disabling Flash by default in Chrome 76, which is due for stable release around July. Chrome users will be able to enable Flash in settings, but the plugin will require explicit permission and then, as of Chrome 69, users need to give permission for each site to use Flash every time the browser is restarted, which is another nice deterrent. So, you know, I'm reminding everyone of this. I mean, the boom really is being lowered on Flash. I'm reminding everyone because aside from the security win of removing this long-standing nightmare um, from our browser ecosystem, every time I mention this, I receive, I receive notes and email from our knowledgeable listeners within various enterprises who are still, who are still, who today remain seriously dependent upon this creaky old technology. Um, you know, and it's not its age that I have a problem with. You know, I'd still be using Windows XP if my machine hadn't died um, and forced me to seven. Um, so it's not age that I have a problem with. It's that it has always been buggy as hell. And Adobe never really cared to expend the time or energy to fix it. They just kept patching it as people kept poking holes in it and people kept getting hurt by it. So, you know, its existence has hurt countless innocent Internet users. And the sooner the better, the, the, the sooner it dies, the better. So 
those knowledgeable listeners of this podcast whose enterprises who, the people who write me every time I talk about this, you know, go tell somebody that, you know, that if that this is mission critical, someone's got to rewrite this for you. Um, and, and what often happens is I hear about, you know, they're using something that, yes, it's 15 years old, but they lost the source code or the only people who <laughs> know, knew, knew how it worked are gone you know, or died or who knows it what. It all the time. But yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> you know, we got these apps in COBOL. Right. And uh, we we need to update them. It's like, uh, okay. Anyway, so, I mean, at some point, it's just, well, I mean, it looks like you could continue to use it, you know, the, through next year if you really have to, but not past that. I mean, if you've got an intranet, you could force people to use old browsers and stuff like that, right? Yeah, although you'd, uh, you'd have to make sure they didn't go reach out to see if there was an update because their browser would go, whoa, <laughs> yeah. am I old? Yeah, we have that problem. Yikes. Yeah, we have a yeah. banking app, a check reader app that you gotta, we got to keep using old Mozilla. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got a piece of Errata Leo. Uh, Mike D, who is a, I actually saw his note in the in the Security Now news group at GRC. It, the subject was Steve. It is pronounced G Ghidra. Yeah, that's what I thought. The, the, yeah, uh, the H is silent. Yes, Ghidra. He says, "Love SN." Have been listening from the beginning in terms of the current episode. He said, "In terms of the current episode, clearly." You are not spending enough time <laughs> playing watch watching <laughs> bad cinema. He says chuckle. It Ghidra, King Ghidra, King Ghidora, and or Monster Zeroes. Zero Zerosis? Zero don't, don't just stop right here. Okay. <laughs> stop trying to read one, those names. <laughs> thank you. One, one, one of the monsters from the same lineage of Japanese monster movies as, oh, Godzilla. Yeah. Godzilla, I know how yeah. to say. Yeah. Mothra and many others. Yeah. It appears in several of those movies and even takes on Godzilla in one. Well, well. Okay, I'm not, I'm not being sucked into this. I'm Ghidra not going to go find out. Oh, no. About, anyway, but now we know it's Ghidra. Um, and, oh, also, I, I forgot to mention last week, I had in my notes, well, actually, it was one of those things that, remember that my system was dead last right. week. It was, in fact, the processor. I killed two of them. I'm no longer overclocking because, you know, no even though not, nothing was getting hot, everything seemed fine, but it took about six months, and then it was the death knell. So uh, what I had forgotten in my notes was, just a little note, that you'll remember that when Windows 10 disk cleanup utility added the downloads folder checkbox yeah i cautioned our listeners that be careful because we may have all had the habit of turning them all on as i certainly had but make sure that if you were turning the downloads folder on you were you intended to de to have it delete all your prior downloads, or at least all zo those that were in the downloads folder. I got a kick out of the fact that this was a this, a this was apparently causing so much trouble that there is now a warning dialog that pops up hmm. from in Windows 10 update to the disk cleanup if that's turned on. So yes, it was biting people. And my last little piece of miscellany before we talk about Zerodium was from our friend Leo, Evan Katz. Oh, yes. Who said, P.S. Yes, file mail is amazing. And the best large transfer service that exists, exclamation point. Mm. I have used it for years. Good to know. And I certainly trust Evan and his uh, opinion on this. I only had... That one experience I mentioned because I had to move a, a nearly six gig VM uh, to Denmark uh, and I was just stunned by the fact that it saturated my my upstream cable modem. I've never seen anything do that for a, like for an hour or two at 33 gigabits. It just it was amazing. So anyway, Evan, thank you for the, the confirmation. And uh, I've got someone whose uh, opinion I trust 
who has used it to move things around for a long time. So, yay. Okay. I've been biting my tongue, not wanting to let the cat out of the bag because this is a ridiculous amount of money. And and who are we fooling about who are <laughs> who who are buying these? Uh, I had to go I had to dig and it in their own FAQ like all the way to the bottom they that like everything every other possible question they had answered themselves. But first let me let me step into this from the front door. So their website proudly proclaims we are Zerodium the leading exploit acquisition platform for premium zero days and advanced cybersecurity capabilities. Then their slogan is, we pay big, all caps, bounties, not bug bounties. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, under our exploit acquisition program, they say, Zerodium is the leading exploit acquisition platform for premium zero days and advanced cybersecurity vulnerabilities. We pay big. <coughs> oh, excuse me. We I had a nose tickle. We pay big bounties to security researchers to acquire their original and previously unreported zero day research. While the majority of existing bug bounty programs accept almost any kind of vulnerabilities and proof of concepts, but pay very low rewards. At Zerodium, we focus on high risk vulnerabilities, meaning, you know, and I'm adding this, the juicy ones, with fully functional exploits. And we pay the highest rewards. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to skip the number here for a minute. Eligible research. Zerodium is currently acquiring zero-day exploits and innovative security research uh, related to the following products. And so it's pretty much all of the mainstream everything everyone uses. Operating systems. We've got Microsoft Windows 10, 8.1, and servers. Oh, look, but not Windows 7. Good. <clears throat> uh, Apple, Mac OS, Mojave, High Sierra, Linux, BSD, CentOS, Ubuntu, etc., VM Escape, VMware, uh, web browsers. They want remote code execution and or, or, or sandbox escape and bypass or both in Chromium, uh, Google's uh, Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Firefox, Tor browser, Apple Safari. For clients and files, remote code execution or sensitive information disclosure from MS Office, files, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, PDF readers, Adobe or Foxit, email clients, Outlook and Thunderbird, file archivers, WinRAR, 7-Zip and WinZip, um, smartphones, Apple iOS, Android, BlackBerry, Windows 10 Mobile, web servers, Apache, Microsoft, Nginx, PHP, and ASP, OpenSSL, Mod SSL, email servers, MS Exchange, Dovecot, never heard of that one, Postfix, Exum, and Sendmail, web apps and panels, cPanel, Plesk, Webmin, WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, vBulletin, MyBB, PHBB, IPS Suite, IP Board, RoundCube, and Horde, and finally, research and technology and techniques, any other security research exploit or technique related to Wi-Fi, baseband RCE, uh, routers, IOT, remote code execution, antivirus, remote code execution, and the, the exactly the, the attack services we were talking about, AV, uh, Tor, de-anonymization. <laughs> okay, who cares about that? Well, we know. Mitigation, bypass, uh, all the notable mobile brands are, li are listed by name. Uh, eligible Linux BSD distributions, all of them. Uh, eligible router brands, all the biggies, Asus, Cisco, D-Link, Huawei, Linksys, Microtik, Netgear, TP-Link, uh, Ubiquiti. 
They said, note, if you have zero-day exploits for other products or systems not listed above, feel free to submit minimal details, and we will gladly discuss the opportunity. Mm. So now, what brought the news was last Monday, January 7th, under new payouts highlights, they said payouts for the majority of desktops, servers, and mobile exploits have been increased. Major changes are highlighted below. So get this. An Apple iOS remote jailbreak, meaning zero click, with persistence, now $2 million. Uh, whoa. Two million who, who, dollars. To whom would that be worth that much? Exactly. Now, uh, exactly. If these guys are paying two million dollars and making a profit, mm. unless they're know, maybe they're a front though for a nation state. Maybe they're not resellers. We don't know. We don't know. That's a that's a very good point. If you, if you need one click, if you have an op, Apple iOS remote jailbreak, which does require a click, well, you can used to be able to get a million, but no, now it's 1.5. So one and a half million dollars, if you're not quite skilled enough to do this with zero clicks, but you can do it with one click, you could still get 1.5 million dollars. For WhatsApp, for iMessage, or SMS MMS remote code execution, $1 million, doubling what it was previously of $500,000. A Chrome remote code execution with LPE, that's of course uh, local privilege elevation, for Android, including a sandbox escape, used to only net you Two hundred thousand dollars now, half a million. Safari <laughs> with a, lo a, a local privilege elevation on iOS, including a sandbox escape. Same story. Ah, used to only be two hundred grand now, half a million. A local privilege escalation to either kernel or root for Android or iOS jumps. It's doubled from a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. And a local PIN or passcode or Touch ID bypass for Android or iOS went from, ooh, this is a, in terms of percentage, a big jump from 15 grand to 100,000. Wow. They said, note, payouts were also increased for other products, including remote code uh, elevation via document and media, remote code uh, execution via man in the middle. ASLR or KASLR -K bypass, information disclosure, etc. cetera. Um, and then on the server desktop side, that was all mobile. And you'll note that because it is the hardest to get into, Apple iOS is at the top of that pack at, a, at $2 million for a zero click or one and a half for a one click. Um, uh, Chrome is down at uh, 500,000 uh, and Safari at the same. So uh, getting getting yourself into uh, Apple iOS, that's still the crown jewel. Uh, and wow, 2 million. Um, on the server or desktop, a Windows remote code execution with zero clicks uh, via uh, SMB, they give an example, or remote desktop protocol packets has doubled from half a million to one million. A Chrome remote code execution on the desktop and a sandbox escape, including so, so you can do something useful once you get out or once you get code to execute, that's doubled also from 250 to half a million dollars. Apache or MS uh, IIS, a, uh, so either of those two major servers, a remote code execution 
remote exploit via HTTPS requests. Good luck with that. But maybe uh, doubled quarter million to half a million dollars. Outlook remote code execution from 150,000 to 250,000. PHP or open SSL remote code execution went from 150 to 250,000. Exchange, uh, MS Exchange server, 150 to 250. VMware, uh, VM Escape, a guest to host escape went as doubled from 100,000 to 200,000. And Windows Local Privilege Escalation or Sandbox Escape. Okay, now, okay, this is exactly what Sandbox Escaper had. She had a Windows Local Privilege Escalation she blew and it. Sandbox Escape. You could have been rich. Went from 50,000 to, to 80,000. So That's a lot like, of one-man tents you could buy with that. That's a lot of hikes you could do out in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah I don't get it. Anyway, so... Um, uh, for uh, they say of their payouts, Zerodium payouts for eligible zero day exploits range from two from two thousand. I don't even know what that is. That's probably. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing here that that's like less than than fifty thousand dollars. So I guess that's got to be easy to make two two grand. Yeah. Anyway, up to two million dollars per submission. The amounts paid by Zerodium to researchers to acquire their original zero-day exploits depend on the popularity and security level of the affected software and system, as well as the quality of the submitted exploit, full or partial chain, supported versions, systems, architectures, reliability, bypassed exploit mitigations, default versus non-default components, process, continuation, etc. For more information, please read our FAQ. The payout ranges listed, listed are provided for information only and are intended for fully functional, reliable exploits meeting Zerodium's highest requirements. Zerodium may pay even higher rewards for exceptional exploits and research. And I love they have this chart that I put into the show notes because it shows the Zerodium submission process. <laughs> we start with, you discover a high-risk, zero-day vulnerability and manage to exploit it. Then, you submit minimal technical details about your research to Zerodium. That's step two. Step three, Zerodium confirms its interest in the research and sends a pre-offer. Step four, you submit the full technical details and exploit to Zerodium. Step five, Zerodium evaluates the research and sends the final acquisition offer. Step six, you accept the Zerodium offer, so have a party, <laughs> and receive and, and receive, profit <laughs> and, and receive your payment within Ooh. one week fast and fast then payments th and then six leads back into one because having gone through this circle once reinvest the cycle of the cycle of life you start looking <laughs> for the next the next really wow. bad Sandbox two million dollars needs to get to work here yeah. Now, I exactly. I don't get what's going on with her. Make some money, honey. Uh, okay. So, uh, we had uh, uh, in, down in their timeline. Uh, they noted September nineteenth, twenty eighteen. Because I was on wanted to dig around a little bit to see more, what more I could find out about who they are. September nineteen, September nineteen, twenty eighteen. So late last year, we. Are, they, they wrote, we are acquiring pre-authentication remote code execution exploits affecting the following routers. Wow. <laughs> Asus, Cisco, D-Link, Linksys, Microtik, Netgear, TP-Link, and Ubiquiti. Exploits leading to authentication bypass or credentials disclosure are also accepted. Exploits relying on cross-site scripting or cross-site uh, cross request, request forgery are not eligible. Hmm. 
Hmm. So here they are proactively soliciting a specific class. We have a client of, who would exactly, like to buy. Exactly. Do, then is this December, illegal in any way? I mean, is it? I, it's, I mean, it really raises my hackles because it just seems like, you know, it ought to be. Uh, on December 20th, a few months later, late last year, we are currently looking for code execution exploits via USB drives on Windows and or Mac OS. The exploit must achieve code execution immediately after the USB key or drive is plugged into the system wow. without relying on visible keystroke injections or user interaction. And so I read these, and then I went looking, I went digging in their FAQ, and all of the first 20 uh, questions are, you know, people rubbing their hands together about how they get paid and can you transfer it directly into my Swiss account and so forth. Anyway, the finally down near the bottom, how the acquired security research is used oh. by Zerodium. How is it used? Uh -huh. They say, Zerodium extensively tests, analyzes, validates, and documents all acquired vulnerability research and reports it along with protective measures and security recommendations solely to its clients <laughs> subscribing to the Zerodium Zero Day Research Feed. Hmm. And then second to the last, that was the second to the last question. And then we wrap with who are Zerodium's customers? Zerodium customers are mainly government organizations yeah. in need. They need them, Leo, in need of specific and tailored cybersecurity capabilities and or protective solutions to defend. That's right. It's, it's like the U.S. Department of Defense to defend against zero day attacks. Access to Zerodium solutions and capabilities is highly restricted and is only available to a very limited, yeah, those with deep pockets, number of organizations. Zerodium does not have any sales partner or reseller. Our solutions are only available through our direct channel. Hmm. Whew. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess, I mean, I would love to get some sense for the, the level of activity in this channel. Even if we had nothing else, if just an alarm kind of went bung every time one of, you know, like one of those transited, it would be interesting hmm. because we don't know what's going on. The, I'm sure part of this research is, I mean, certainly the discoverers are are locked up in an NDA. They can't share with anybody else right. in in return for what they have discovered. Yeah. Um, the if if a if a government organization is paying big bucks to be on the Zerodium feed, they're being careful with it because its entire value to them is only to the degree that it remains unknown to the world in order, I mean, you know, gee, what could you do with a USB drive that ran code on a Windows or Mac when you just plug it into a USB without requiring any keystrokes? Hmm. Gee, gee, hmm. don't know. Or why could you want to take over an Apple iOS mobile device um, without you know, with either zero or one keystroke. Hmm. Hmm. How could that how could that come in handy? <laughs> wow, anyway, it's, really it's interesting. It really to, yes to to me it just seems bizarre that there is a marketplace now. I mean, an out front in your face. We're giving you. We will pay two million dollars. I mean, the, the thing that's a little annoying is that we know how porous security is. The harder you look, the more you find. And 
$2 million is a heck of an incentive for someone to, to dig down into somebody else's code and see if they can find a mistake somewhere. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, fascinating. Yeah. Just fascinating. Um, we have no idea who they are. And when did they, when did they appear? They've been around for a few years now. We we've talked about them several times. Yeah, and so so an increase in bounty probably means the that they're that the 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 government feed that may have increased in number or in cost. Yeah, so that they can afford to pay more. It might mean that that like security is tightening up, so they're having to incent. The 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 researchers oh, unquote that, that could be too it could be supply and demand if the supply shrinks um, maybe yeah yeah they they want so to like, pay more please yeah. please look harder yeah because you know we really do want these we've got a, our customers are clamoring it also means there's competition from other sources like uh, the companies themselves remember Apple for a long time refused to do this because they were afraid of ratcheting up well the market for Leo. This. Pwn to own. I mean, pwn to own is 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 developers giving basically saying, "Hey, I got a laptop." <laughs> I, you know, ra rather than two million dollars, or you know, for a lesser exploit, right. two hundred thousand. Right. I, you know, I got a, I got a, I got a really cool sweatshirt. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I own this Macintosh, and all I got was this T-shirt. <laughs> That's right. Uh, what is your what is your judgment? Uh, is it harder to find these than it has been in the past, or easier? Yes, it is yes. harder. It, yes, yes. Okay, because we're all aware of it, and companies are working much harder to protect. You know, security. Microsoft chiefly uh, doing a lot to you know lock its operating system down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what a great subject, and thank you for another great show. I appreciate it. You'll find Steve at grc.com, the Gibson Research Corporation. That's where he does his uh, his main work, which is, of course, Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. And he also gives away a lot of stuff. Shields up. Uh, he talks a lot about passwords there. There's also health information and, of course, the latest on Squirrel. Soon, soon, Squirrel will emerge into the world. The little baby will bushy, be born. A little bushy little tail. Right, hide and bushy-tailed squirrel. Uh Oh, Steve also has the uh, podcast there, audio and uh, transcripts of every show at his website, grc.com. You can get uh, get them there or get them from us at uh, twit.tv slash sn. We also have video. And um, he can be reached and followed at grc, sggrc. That's his uh, Twitter handle, at sggrc. Yep. You can DM him there, too, if you've got a tip. Uh, if you are interested in watching us do the show live, you want the latest, freshest security as we bake it, so to speak, security news, you can go to twit.tv slash live every Wednesday around 1, th I'm sorry, Tuesday around 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern. That's uh, 2130 UTC. And you can join the folks watching live in our chat room at irc.twit.tv. But as I said, you can always get on-demand versions on our site, on Steve's site, or your favorite podcast application. Subscribe and you'll get it automatically. The minute it's available and you can listen at your leisure. Steve, have a great week. We'll see you next time on Security Now. Thank you, Leo. I'm sure the week will bring us lots of new things to talk about next week. So, <laughs> till then. Bye. <laughs> Juicy stuff. Security Now.